So when I came here, I had to learn quickly. But what Nigeria shapes you to be is to learn, to be adaptive, to be a survivor, to be resourceful. Yeah. So quite quickly, you see all of the resources that are available to you that a lot of people here actually take for granted. And, you know, I think, like I said, I can't carry last. What's this in front of us? I'll get it to wave now. Start to look at the world around you. Start to look at the things that you want to see that can be better. Mm. And then start to think about how can I create something that can make the world better. I was born in Nigeria. I grew up in Ede. So, Ede is Oshun State. Oshun State. So oh, okay. moved to the UK when I was about 13 because my mum came as a medical nurse and then the whole family came with her. And, uh, you know, I was a, a child that was interested in engineering. Even back in Nigeria, I, I worked in a, a radio shack where you repair radios and things like that. Oh, really? And um, I did that for a bit, like that, quite a young age, maybe I was seven or eight. And then when I came to the UK, I had access to robotics, like, you know, after school clubs. So I took advantage of everything. And then when I got to to university age I needed to choose a subject and for me because I was already interested in robotics this is where you can look at nature be inspired use that to create things robotics was really the one for me that's the long story short of how I got into robotics itself so why robotics even from Nigeria yeah. I was the type of kid that would spend a lot of time in nature. And, and people are thinking, okay, how do you get from nature to robotics? Yeah. So, you know, like I was saying to you earlier, my favorite place in Nigeria is a, a small town, not a village anymore, called Odiomu. That's my grandma was there. So we would always go to visit. I would spend time in the woods, just observing animals, just observing how nature works, the beauty of it. And then you look at life itself, creatures, mm. how they move. So I would be looking at spiders. How does this thing walk? And so to look at it and then to try to recreate it. I think robotics is a creative art in itself. It's how do you make something that can exist in the world and have an impact and do some activity. You can obviously go down and define what a robot is, which is it needs to have some intelligence to be able to impact the world. That's, uh, you know, where the link comes from. Looking at nature, looking at how things move, asking questions, just marveling in the beauty of life that we have and then trying to then do something as well. What's this in front of us? This so, is so this was my, my first uh, company. I'll get it to wave now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you make it come towards me? Oh wow, okay stop stop. <laughs> The story of how I got into this was, um, so as I was at university, I knew I always wanted to make a living through robotics. And mm. some of the things that they were teaching us were to do with industrial robots. I wanted to do robotics because of transformers, all these amazing things yeah, that I saw. So these them. things that wow you. So I started an after school club where I was teaching robotics to young kids. Yeah. I got the university, so I pitched to the university. I got some funding. I pitched to Hewlett Packard. I got some funding as well. So this was my first cutting my teeth into entrepreneurship that you don't mm. need to go down a traditional job path. And when I saw that the robotics kids were using Lego at the time, when I saw that the kids that were normally rowdy, they were very, very engaged, then I thought, you know, a lot of the products on the market are really, really boring. Can we create something that feels like a video game character in real life that can both entertain and use that entertainment as a way to get people to learn more about engineering, about um, robotics itself? So that's how we started. This is called uh, Mechamon, short for Mechanical Monster, a bit like Pokemon, Pokemon oh, Monster. Oh, Mechanical Monster. And the company that brought that out was uh, Reach Robotics. Yeah. And that's your company? So that, that, that's my company. So that was my first uh, company. We closed that in 2019 because th this you know, product has two identities. It has the entertainment part and the education part. The education part is actually a lot stronger than the entertainment part because the entertainment part then means you're competing in markets with the likes of Asbro, you're only selling at Christmas, all of those types of stuff. So again, going from engineering to the business side, I had to learn on the job. So it was kind of the, the first business was me living my dream of building robots, bringing my wildest imagination to life. And quickly we learned that okay we have to focus on the education element of it so we closed the business in, in 2019 um, the assets for the the product itself was then acquired into Awari uh, which means to seek and find in, in Yoruba which is a, a business that's focused on education and developing the robotics infrastructure across Africa and we started initially in Nigeria a lot of the work that we've been doing. So you said this company, you closed it down in mm -hmm. 2019. Yeah. Why? Like, so, it looks... Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the hardware is a challenging business. And, and if you actually look, there aren't too many robotics companies or startups today. Mm -hmm. And that's because, as I mentioned before, the robotics industry is actually still quite young in itself. But as I mentioned, we had two elements, the entertainment part and the education part. So that business itself primarily was focused on the entertainment part. You know, mm -hmm. sell it at Christmas, let people buy it, things like that. And then let people discover the education aspect. So instead 
instead of doing that, we're now just purely focused on the education aspect. So you're using this in schools. Teachers are using it in schools to teach um, mm. robotics and to teach education. Oh. So that's the, the primary focus and we're doing that through Awari. This is like very fascinating to me. Mm. So when you were selling this, like how much was it? And is there plans of eventually bringing this back yeah. to the market? So this was about $300 when we oh. were selling it at the time. So not, not a cheap uh, buy, but it was actually cheap for what you were getting. So it's a robust package. And that was the first version. We have a second version that Awari will bring to market um, soon as well. And then we have a second version that is uh, is a different shape, going to be cheaper and also much more accessible. Because the goal for us is how can we make this the robotics education platform across Africa so that young people are not disadvantaged because of their location. They can have access to a product that's not just built with them in mind, but is also relevant. never programmed before will allow you to draw hmm. so if you're a kid you've never coded in your life you can literally just you know draw a line and say walk forward and it'll and it'll walk forward oh you know? wow and then you can start to do stuff like change the head just we want to make the connection between this is your thinking and this is what the robot can do Moving from this one, yeah. what is this? Now I, I focus on Awari as I mentioned, but also um, Reach Industries. Um, so that is a, comp a visual AI company. And what that means is we are taking visual data, so images, videos that are generated in life sciences, so inside labs. Imagine you're a scientist in a lab and you're running an experiment that runs for 48 hours. Unless you sit in the lab for 48 hours, you're going to miss some stuff that yeah. happened. So we allow them to have modules like this. This is just one of the modules that we use to capture data, gathers data about what's going on, and we can tell them this this is what happened with your reaction. This is when it changed. So all of the functions that human would be doing, the manual data capturing, we augment the scientists so that they can do their work better and just focus on the science part of it. So what's Awari? So Awari is the education company um, yeah. that is focused on democratizing access to frontier technology across Africa. So then we start with education. How do we make sure that young people have access to tools like this to be able to bring their wildest dream to life, to not just because you're in Nigeria, um, not be able to build robotics like a kid in another part of the world. So education is what we're starting from. The second thing we're also focused on is research. You know, can we build an environment where you create a pipeline where people are coming out of education and they can also do interesting, you know, world-class research. So for example, you're looking at here, this is a robot called Baxter. And when it came out, the idea was that um, you'd just literally be able to show the robot how to work. So for example, rather than having to program it, you would show it, lift it, show it exactly where it needed to go and what it needed to do. Hmm. and then it would remember that. What are some of the challenges you face being in that space at the inception, you know? Robotics, it's not something everybody does. Everything. Yeah, I mean, so first of all is there aren't too many paths to follow. So hmm. for example, there are other types of businesses where there's a template you can kind of follow, yeah. you know, make sure the users are growing kind of like this. With robotics, you have to manufacture a physical product. Hmm. So you have to set up your supply chain. Hmm. You have to do the research. And in many cases, you also have to build the product in a way where you can update it when it's in the hands of of the customer a bit like your mobile phone mm. so the barrier to entry how you start is just a lot higher the stakes are also higher so the capital investment that you need at the start mm. so that means you need to raise funding so i didn't really have access to money at the start of my journey i had to go and get a lot of grants first of all which luckily the uk has a strong ecosystem for that so i had to get a grant from the university and then also get a grant from the government to build prototypes to get the prototypes to a place where investors could then say okay i can see that there's something here that could be value in the long term. How important do you feel it is for like Africans to be involved in robotics? I think it's one of the most important things, not just robotics, but frontier technologies. Technology. In that bucket, you have artificial intelligence, you have robotics itself, and you have biotech itself as well. Those are some of the things that will shape the world for the centuries to come. The reason why artificial intelligence is important is if we don't start working on it, we're going to be left behind. If you look at a country like China, they worked hard to develop, to move out of a, a agricultural kind of economy to make sure that they have manufacturing as a strong foundation, which has a lot of robotics involved because you have automated system. That helped the country to develop into an economic power of a whole nation, of a whole continent, as you invest in these technologies. What can be done to make this change happen faster? So practical example is um, definitely you can look at what's been done in other countries. There is a role for the government to play to subsidize in some way. You know, in the UK, there's no shortage of grants. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of grant funding. Every month you can apply to 
Innovate UK, there's research facilities to just make sure that all of these questions, what is research? These questions are being asked about, you know, can we build technology that can make human life better, that can lessen suffering, all of these things. And then, you know, you provide funding, you allow people to not worry about survival mm. so that they can start to self-actualize. Yeah. So you've got that Maslow's hierarchy of need at the yeah. bottom is survival and then all these other stuff. Yeah. When you make sure that that is taken care of and yeah. that is through grants, you know, um, subsidies, whatever, to make sure that that foundation is there, then people can actually start using the brain power to focus on elevating the world around them. Did you ever face any form of discrimination or just because you were black, you didn't get access to something? The truth is, if I did, I wouldn't know because <laughs> because it's, it's already a, a difficult journey. So when you're so focused on the hustle or the goal, yeah. and it's a challenge anyway, you have to overcome that. I think if you allow yourself to shine and you don't let anyone shut down the light that is inside you, you keep going, you find a way to keep going. So I never felt that I was disadvantaged. What was that journey like, like leaving Nigeria, where you were used to and coming to the UK? The first week when I got to school, this kid asked me like, oh, do you live in huts? So, you know, when you talk about some of those subtle things, so yeah. in, as part of my journey, of course, I've encountered those types of things, but I see them for what they are, which yeah. is ignorance, yeah. you know, and there's a media story that's kind of been told. I learned as a child quite quickly that there can be worlds of differences in, in perception. And so it's really, really important that you have a strong internal kind of identity. So, you know, that journey landing in the UK, you know, uh, going through the first, uh, winter, my hard-working parents, and then starting to see that, oh, what we're really good at in Nigeria is actually the theoretical education. I had to essentially wait for two years for the curriculum to catch up to the things that I knew mm. um, already from Nigeria. We just don't have as much of the practical. I was excited to have the opportunity to just after school club, do robotics, you know, mm. uh, all of this stuff. And also, you know, even in, in Nigeria, I went to a school in, in Oshogo and I remember I, there was this task we had to do to open Word documents on the computer and I failed that task. So when I came here, I had to learn quickly. But what Nigeria shapes you to be is to learn, to be adaptive, mm. to be a survivor, to be resourceful. Yeah. So quite quickly, you see all of the resources that are available to you that a lot of people here actually take for granted. And, you know, I think, well, I can't, like I said, I can't carry last. There's also this wave happening, you know, it's called the Jakba wave. The trend and wave of Nigerians who are leaving the country, a term now popularly called Jakba. What are your thoughts on that? First of all, you're born as a, as a human. You've seen the benefit of travel. It opens up your mind. Yeah. So I think it's important to just travel and get perspective. So should you Jakba or not? That is your personal decision. I think, you know, as a human, th these are getting into philosophies, but we should yeah. be borderless oh. in yeah. a way. Yeah. We should yeah. be able yeah. to explore the world. This yeah. world, sure. there's so many different things. I've seen amazing things across the world. That said, you know, I have a strong love and a bias for Nigeria. I mm. miss Nigeria. And also, you know, all of the family that I have there, the day today challenges that yeah. people are feeling that inspires me to try and that's why I worry exists you know myself and my co-founder and a big part of our thinking is the mission here is how can we give more young people opportunities to be able to build to be able to create mm. so if you have to go somewhere to get that knowledge to then come back just never forget home never forget to put back in home I think the more that is done back home the more that is done on the continent for the uplifting of Nigeria changes the experience the perception for all black people in the diaspora across the world Living in London or living yeah. in the UK, yeah. what's it like? Things are expensive. That, yeah. That's the first thing. But it, it's relative. You know, for example, at least on a person point of view, it's not as expensive because it's societally um, subsidized. It's what you put in to some extent that you get. Like I said, you know, my story, this kid from a, you should have seen me, you know, this kid from a village to building companies here to, you know, I've met lots of, lots of interesting people along the way, done lots of interesting stuff. And that's all because my journey went through this country, you know, at some point. So I see it as a journey. I don't see this place as where I'll spend all of my life. It's, mm. it's a part of my, of my yes. journey. Oh. What would be your advice to them for a lot of young people who want to get started? Wherever you are in the world, first thing is create. Just mm. don't let that creativity die. And if you want to go down the robotics path, just play. Mm. Just do things that are interesting for you. Don't focus just on the solving problems right now, but just play. And then at the end of that, once you've learned some foundational skills, you've learned some things like programming, start to look at the world around you. Start to look at the things that you want to see that can be better. Mm. And then start to think about how can I create something that can make the world better? And then 
start to find people that think in a similar way to you so you can start to form a team and start to build things together awesome awesome thank yeah. you lot for sharing your yeah, story thank with you, me. Bro. yeah <laughs> thank you thank you so guys i'm gonna link the links to the company in the description below so if you want to contact them if you have any business or ideas or whatever just reach out to them and that's all we have to share with you today if you love this video please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel i will see you guys on the next one peace <laughs>